Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joe Stoltz, and I'm the director of George of the George Washington Leadership Institute at Mount Vernon. I'm subbing in tonight for Kevin Butterfield and Jim Embusky, but don't worry. I got called up from the minor leagues for a reason. Uh, I want to welcome all of you, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Ford Evening Book Talk, uh, sponsored by the Ford Motor Company. So yes, that Ford. Uh, quick programming notes, just so that we can, uh, can let you know what's going on in our world here uh, virtually at the library. Uh, March 16th will be the opening night of our 2021 Michelle Smith Lecture Series. Uh, it will feature the book, The Virginia Dynasty, and be a conversation with its author, Lynn Cheney, and tickets are available through the Mount Vernon website. And April 29th uh, will be our next Ford Evening Book Talk, uh, featuring a book called uh, The First Inauguration, George Washington and the Invention of the Republic. Uh, and that will be a conversation with its author, Stephen H. Brown. But most importantly, tonight's program, because it's the one you're watching at the moment, uh, and it's going to be a discussion uh, focused on the book, A Crisis of Peace, George Washington, The Newburgh Conspiracy, and the Fate of the American Republic uh, by Dr. David Head. Uh, we chose this month of March uh, to, to feature this book uh, because we are just five days away from the, the, the sort of culminating moment of, of the book, uh, what becomes known as the Newburgh Address. That occurred five days ago, 238 years. So that's a long time. Uh, it is just, if you're keeping count, also 421 years since uh, William Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar premiered, uh, and 2064 years uh, since uh, when Caesar uh, first uh, played a leading role in not being aware of the Ides of March. And if you're not sure why uh, I'm throwing in those references, Buckle up, it's gonna be exciting. Uh, so our guest tonight is Dr. David Head. He is a historian, author, and lecturer of history at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. He is originally from Western New York and he received his BA in history from Niagara University and his PhD from the University of Buffalo. He is also the author uh, of one previous book, Privateers of the Americas, Spanish American Privateering from the United States in the Early Republic. Uh, which won the 2016 John Gardner Maritime Research Award. Uh, and as thrilled as we are that he won an award for that book, uh, in our opinion, most importantly, David was also a member of the Washington Library's 2015-2016 class of research fellows here uh, at the Washington Library. Uh, and a lot of his work that he, he did on this Newburgh book uh, was completed during his time at Mount Vernon. So we're not taking credit for the book. We're just taking credit for David. Uh, and the book, A Crisis of Peace, uh, was a finalist for this past year's 2021 George Washington Book Prize. So you are in store for a wonderful talk tonight. So welcome, David. Well, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah. I'm delighted to, uh, to talk to you here today. Um, this is one of, the, one of the events I wanted to do most uh, when, when the book was published, was to be able to talk to the audience of Mount Vernon. Well, that's what we like to hear. Um, now, I want to I want to start off. Um, so, as as I know you know, but uh, it, it'll it'll make more sense for my question maybe if uh, if I if I give a little background uh, real quick. So, my for the for the audience, you know, my my previous job prior to coming here at Mount Vernon was as a professor of military history at West Point, uh, and our goal our goal right we didn't always necessarily achieve it, but our goal. Uh, was that no cadet would leave West Point without knowing about uh, the Newburgh conspiracy and the Newburgh address and, and the events that had sort of transpired there. Um, but that's not, I think, something that a lot of K through 12 or, or civilian university professors normally have the time to emphasize uh, or necessarily the reason to emphasize in their uh, their normal survey courses. So. Um, just in case anyone in, in our audience listening right now or watching right now is not familiar, would you sort of go over sort of what, what were the broad strokes of what led to Newburgh in March of 1783? I thought I thought the war was over in October 1781 after Yorktown. Yeah, so so that's one of the things that, that attracted me to this project at first was that it was a chance to look into this period at the end of the war. So the, the victory at Yorktown is October 1781. 
but the, the news of the final peace treaty doesn't arrive in the United States until, until November of uh, 1783. So there's this two-year period where, I mean, what's going on? That, that, that's one of the things I was most kind of interested in. What was it like to live through that period where, I mean, the war is still formally a war, but there's not a lot of at least large-scale fighting. Um, just what was it like to live during that period and when there was neither war nor peace, really? Uh, so the, the Newburgh conspiracy then was a way to tell the story of those last two years of the war, kind of a, a, in a focused way. Uh, through kind of one event driving things forward, but to look more broadly at just how the war was concluded. The circumstances at the at the end of the war, um, as the kind of the urgency of fighting kind of subsides, there are issues that emerge that have always been there, but can take on a special a, a special prevalence. Things like the the financial situation of the uh, of the government, uh, both the state governments and the Continental Congress. Um, there's this rampant inflation because uh, one way that the, the uh, Continental Congress paid for the war is by printing money and more, printing more money and more money and more money and then a little more money until it completely lost all of its value. What, what, what do you do about that? that? That's one big problem. Uh, repaying loans that have been taken out from uh, France uh, was the biggest, uh, most generous lender to the United States, but also some other countries. Just, just how to pay really ultimately pay off the war uh, was a big question. The relationship between the states and the Continental Congress was another major question. The, uh, the government at the time, the Articles of Confederation, really gave the states most of the power to do things. And the, the central government, the Continental Congress, they could make resolutions, right? Re re really recommendations. New states ought to do X, Y, and Z. And the states would do these sometimes if it was in their interest to do it or not, if they didn't feel like they wanted to do it. Uh, so there's really nothing to compel them to do anything. Uh, so those two problems really emerged, and that's a lot of what is going to drive the conflict with uh, among the states and various factions and also the anxiety of the Continental Army. Well, yeah, and I mean, what what is... Uh sort of, I mean, because it, it is that weird thing, right, of, of, you know, 1781, Yorktown, yay, right, 1782, I mean, before Washington is even leaving to go on the Yorktown campaign, he's making preparations, trying to get the logistical situation up in New York ready, because he's worried there might have to be a 1782 uh, campaign. Um, but then that, that Northern Army, that main army, I mean, a lot of their, their activity, what, is just basically sitting up around what's now West Point, New York, and sort of the Hudson Highlands, is it is it just to keep an eye and make sure the Brits don't get squirrely since they haven't given up possession of New York City yet? Yeah, so, so yeah, it, that, that's exactly a good way to put it. So after the, the after Yorktown, the British still occupy the, the major American seaports, um, Charleston and Savannah, and New York, most, most importantly of all. So the bulk of the army uh, moves from Yorktown up to the Hudson Highlands, so around West Point today, uh, well, New Windsor, Newburgh, of course. And they're just there above, um, on the Hudson River there, above New York City, in case the British decide to break out of New York City and then maybe resurrect their old strategy of gaining control of the Hudson River to cut the New England colonies off from the mid-Atlantic uh, colonies there. Um, you know, they're just kind of keeping an eye. Uh, the rest of, there's a small uh, part of the army that is in South Carolina under, under General Green. But most of them are in New York, and they're just they're just waiting, waiting for something, either the war to end or the British to renew the battle, and they just wait. Well, and I I, I mean I, I I I can't even imagine what the morale problem must have been within an army that I mean, especially among the officer corps, where they they a lot of them tended to serve for longer periods of time than sort of the bulk of the enlisted force, right? Not a lot of the enlisted force are signing up for the duration of the war. They're normally using set terms of enlistments, but a lot of the officers, I think it's fair to say a lot of them um, were sort of as long as I can. Um, but, you know, this is an eight year conflict. And and uh, one of the things I liked that, in, that your book really, um, I think did an excellent job of sort of detailing um, 
how much that conflict started to cost the officers. Yeah, so it's, you're right. When, when, when there's fighting to be done, you can concentrate on that. But when there's not a lot to do, you start to think. Um, let, let's say the, the philosopher Pe Pascal said uh, some enormous percent of uh, man's problems are the inability to sit quietly with your own thoughts. Right? When you start thinking and thinking about things, then, then trouble starts. And the officers have a lot to, to think about and to see about the sacrifices they've made, uh, you know, the, the long service they've had. Uh, they haven't really been paid during the war. Uh, and when they were paid, it was usually in currency that depreciated its value very quickly. Uh, they've been promised pensions, but throughout most of the war, it was, they were, it was just a promise, a promise to keep them from resigning. And it worked in the moment. But, you know, that just pushes out the decision to fund those pensions into the future. As the war is winding down, uh, the army starts to be reduced in size to cut costs. And uh, there's a, a number of officers who are uh, who leave the service, who, who are kind of forced into retirement uh, as, the, as they you know, kind of reduce proportionally the size of the army. And those guys aren't getting their pensions because no money has been set aside to pay them. So the main body of the, the officers can see what's going to happen to them. Um, if the war should end before kind of any uh, fiscal, uh, I mean, not, not even solvency, just, just anything is done to put their fiscal house in order. Uh, those officers, they sacrifice a lot just in terms of the, the ones who have families, right, haven't seen their family, or their families don't know reliably where their sustenance is going to come from. Um, you know, it's the ability to borrow, certainly, to, to, to rely on friends and all that kind of stuff. That, that helps, but that's not you know very reliable from yeah. one, one season to another. Some of the younger officers who don't have families you know, have to wonder what, what's going to happen to them because they, they have this fancy title uh, of being you know major so-and-so or whatever. That, that'll be impressive. That, that'll help them on the marriage market. Um, but not if they show up in rags and they're penniless and they have no other prospects other than this great title. Uh, that's not, that, that can only go, go so far. So there's a lot of anxiety about the future, what it's going to bring. Will all this sacrifice ultimately be worth it if their if their lives are ruined afterwards? Well, and that's I'd say I always find with some of the letters and stuff that that are you know documentary evidence that we have um, the sort of weirdness of of the officers almost start to get anxious about what if peace comes too fast at some point. Yeah, that, that's a weird thing. And that's often right. why, why I come back. It's like, don't you guys want to go home? Don't you want this over as soon as possible? And, and of course they do on the one hand. Uh, but when they start to think about it, they say, well, if we if the peace arrives tomorrow and the order to disband comes next week and nothing's been settled, we have no leverage. I mean, once we go home and we're separated from each other, we'll have to you know, it's not like they can move, they can meet each other very easily. They can't set up a Facebook group for, uh, you know, former officers and coordinate themselves and all that kind of stuff. They're going to be physically distant from each other and put into different states. And it's going to be hard to push Congress or really anybody in a unified way to get their accounts settled. Um, there's a fear about some of the officers that if they don't get a firm commitment from Congress before the war ends, then... The people might just say, okay, thanks, guys. Those look great the way you want independence for us. You know, thanks. But, um, yeah, we can't pay you. So, um, yeah, good work. Okay. You know, Attaboy. Attaboy, right, exactly. Yeah. You know, and, a, and a pat on the back isn't going to cut it. So that's ultimately why I, I decided to call the book A Crisis of Peace. Um, I thought the, the kind of unexpectedness of that, those two ideas together uh, might be a little bit, uh, might catch people's attention. But I think that is kind of thing, what's driving, really pushing the story forward is that if peace arrives, that's going to bring everything to a final crisis. And the officers will have to decide what they're going to do. Do we go home penniless and just hope for the best? Or do we make some kind of stand against, um, you know, for something to try and try and, and, and pry, pry loose the, uh, or pry open the, uh, the, the government's uh, pocketbook there to give them some money for their futures. Well, and I think that's what makes, you know, I, I, you know, there's lots of the parts that, you know, I think make this interesting. But, you know, on the one hand, this is this is sort of basic labor dispute 101, right? You want leverage during the arbitration process. On the other, this is an army 
which, you know, going on strike in the army is called a mutiny and is you know, times of war punishable by death. Um, and, and so, I mean, what, what were the, I mean, we've been talking about from sort of the army's perspective, I mean, were there concerns in Congress about the army? Uh, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, a hundred years before the new model army under Oliver Cromwell certainly hadn't gone away quietly when parliament would have preferred it to. Um, you know, these are folks that were well aware of their classics. And, and I mean, I, I love the, the number of op-ed, essentially op-eds in the newspapers you see in this time period, uh, discussing what should be done with the army that are using, you know, Brutus and Cato as uh, pseudonyms, right? So they're well aware of Caesar and, and, and uh, the Roman Senate. I mean, what, what is the discussion in Congress? Right, so there are, there are a lot of rumors floating around that the army has already decided that they're not going to disband. And I, I, I don't think that's, that's not reality, but when information is so hard to come by, uh, reliable information is hard to come by, you know, sometimes the rumor becomes reality uh, simply because that's all, that's all you have. So there are a lot of congressmen, you know, who are, who are writing home to their, their, their state delegation saying, you know, the rumor is that the army has decided that they will not disband even if they're ordered to. Okay. Now you bring up this historical example. So this is, the historian, this is something you're not supposed to say, but I'll say it anyway. These guys know their history too well. Um, <laughs> they, they tend to think that there's some sort of iron law of history, that this is the way all armies act. This is the, you know, the way that the new, ar new model army acted. That's the way it is always going to be in these circumstances. Um, so it's, it's too sort of Newtonian, too sort of a mechanistic, the kind of a mechanistic view of the world where this is just the way the world always works. It worked that way in antiquity and in the 17th century. That's the way the army will necessarily work. They don't have a great appreciation that individual circumstances, things could be different. Um, so that's, that's really interesting thing. It's like, just if you could just forget about your new model army stuff, or at least remember this is a hundred some years later, okay? Uh, and this is not the same circumstances, you know. Uh, forget your history a little bit. Is this, that does not need to repeat itself. Okay, so all those things, I think, would have been useful for the Congress to keep in mind. But um, yeah, they seem to think you know the rumors are that this is, could easily become a situation like during the the English Civil War. Well, and it, you you just mentioned about or um, you know, said about how there were lots of rumors floating around, and you know we call it the Newburgh conspiracy. But I mean, the 18th century was a a a period rife with sort of, uh, I think, conspiratorial thinking uh, in the U.S. Maybe that has an act. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't be dumping all that on the 18th century. Maybe some of that's still around, obviously. But you know, it, it strikes me as such a, a dangerous situation that you have these two groups, uh, you know, the army and Congress, sort of staring warily at each other, and they both seem to um, kind of be thinking the worst about each other and being willing to to sort of um, yeah, think think the worst about each other. Yeah, so this is, these are some other things that really drew me to the project initially. Um, I've been kind of interested in conspiracy theories, conspiracy thinking, um, in other contexts. Be careful how you phrase that. You've been yeah, <laughs> for, for 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 a long time. Yes, conspiracy thinking. Yeah. Um, for a long time, you know, I mean, even back to when I was a teenager, I really liked the X Files of the nineteen nineties. Right, uh, you know, the truth is out there, and there's all these government conspiracies. Uh, one of my favorite episodes is when one of the um, the ring one of the one of the government officials who, who's in the know who's at the kind of the puppet master knows all the conspiracies. Uh, supposedly, the episode shows like how he's a central player in the, the JFK uh, assassination and various alien abductions and all kind of stuff. And it, it, supposedly, he gives the order. This is the 1990s that that the Buffalo Bills, my my football team, will, will never win the Super Bowl. Um, and of course, they did it. They lost four times in a row. Yeah. Uh, so, so I like that. That that was I really like that that show that episode in particular. Um, but then as I you know kind of, kind of got older, I, I kind of kept a little bit of interest in the, the the Kennedy assassination and all those kind of things, and just sort of where these ideas come from and why they seem to be so appealing. The 18th century, um, right? It's just it's just assumed that things are a conspiracy. That if something bad happened to you, it's because somebody else in, intended it. So, you know, take the Stamp Act, for example. American colonists, they assume that the officials in Britain were out to deprive them of their liberties. The idea that maybe these guys in Parliament don't know what they're doing, um, or certainly 
they don't know what they're doing, forming policies for people they've never met who live so far distant when condition, when uh, communications are so difficult, six weeks, you know, one way. Um, yeah, maybe they just don't know what they're doing very well and they made a mistake. Uh, but no, it had to be that they're sitting in a room thinking, how can we get those Americans? And the, the British officials think the same way about the, about the colonists. They assume that the colonists are plotting a way to, be, to just have anarchy, uh, not that they're upset about a misguided policy. So everybody in 18th century thinks that way. And it goes beyond the, the Anglo-American uh, sphere. It's in, um, in all the European countries think that way. Uh, as I thought more about this, I think sort of conspiracy thinking is something that, that's just part of the human condition. This is one of the ways in which people make sense of a complex world. And one of the ways in which people try to make some kind of sense out of the kind of awful accidents that, that happen to people yeah. um, that just don't really have any other good explanation other than bad luck. But that's, you know, not satisfying a lot of times. It's just, it was bad luck that this terrible thing happened. In some ways, it seems more attractive if you can blame somebody for it. So at least then there's something you maybe could do about it, you know, get that person out of power. You, you can't, you can't fight luck. I and mean, it's just, you just can't. So I think that's part of what we're seeing in the Newberg story is this sort of 18th century way of thinking where it couldn't possibly be that people are making mistakes. It has to be that somebody is trying to drive this wedge between the army and the Continental Congress. Yeah, well, and so, I mean, let's, so I think we've, I think we've, it's going to make some sort of art joke about priming our canvas, but the, the painting <laughs> behind you is too, too, too good for that. Um, you know, so what goes down in February and March in Newburgh? So uh, in December, actually, at the end of December, the officers had gathered and they sent a, a letter, a memorial petition to the Continental Congress, and some of the officers delivered it to Philadelphia. And the congressmen are, are generally receptive to it. They agree that the officers have suffered and that the officers' demands are really just. I mean, the officers are asking for what was promised to them. I mean, how could you right, dispute that? But trying to come up with an adequate solution is very difficult given the financial circumstances and the ways that the government works in relation to the power really being in the state. So coming up with the money is, is really hard. Um, the officers are, are waiting. And the news from Philadelphia is kind of like what I described. It's like, yeah, they want to do something, but it's going to take time. And then there's always these rumors that are kind of filtering in, not, not, a, not just the rumors, like official word that, a peace treaty uh, is on the way, that an agreement has been concluded, that an armistice could be coming any day. And you don't know when the ship is going to arrive. I mean, it could arrive tomorrow morning. It could arrive a month from now with that news that's supposedly on the way. So the officers are getting antsy. In uh, early March, there is uh, a letter is written uh, by John Armstrong Jr., a, a young officer, uh, an aide to General Horatio Gates who's the, the second, second in command in Newburgh, uh, second to General Washington. Uh, this letter circulates through camp. It circulates anonymously, so, so uh, Armstrong did not attach his name to it. And this letter, um, it really calls on the officers uh, to meet and to discuss sending a stronger message to Congress. Uh, it says, abandon your milk and water style uh, of, your, of your previous memorial, which is a nice, way of putting it. I don't know that I've ever put milk and uh, water and milk together. That, that sounds gross, but you get the idea. Um, this letter, uh, it also sort of kind of rouses, tries to rouse the officer saying, look, you've been disrespected. Congress is not going to, not going to do anything for you unless you do something now. And probably the most notorious portion of this letter comes when Armstrong talks to the army about what he calls his uh, what, what, what Armstrong calls the officers' alternatives, uh, their options. So option one is that if the war should continue, he reminds the officers that they don't have to fight. They can just refuse to, to serve. And then the Continental Congress is on their own to fight the British. Or if news of peace should arrive, Armstrong says, the uh, officers, they don't have to leave the field. I mean, they can... Uh, just stay with their arms and say, pay us or we don't go home. So that becomes the most notorious part of the letter, the most inflammatory part of the letter. 
Uh, and that's really where the kind of the whole crisis of, of everything, the money and the, the relationship between the civilian and the, the government, the uh, military really just explodes into the open. Well, and so, I mean, what comes, so Armstrong's letters circulating around and I mean, you know, we, I, I got to ask the $10 million question for this place. Where is Washington as all this is going at? Where, what, where is Washington as all this is going on? So, um, so some of the geography here is interesting. So it's known as the Newburgh Conspiracy, but most of the events happen in New Windsor, which is a town uh, slightly south. So Washington's headquarters are in, um, are in, New, are in New Windsor, I'm uh, sorry, in, in uh, Newburgh, and that is a, um, a state historical site. Um, you see a picture of it there. That's a picture I took when I visited in the summer of 2016. Uh, this is in July 2016, so you have to imagine the, the snow and the wind and all that kind of stuff for March in upstate New York. Um, so that's Washington's headquarters, and that's where he has his whole operation. Uh, a, a, an old Dutch widow lived there previously, and she had the option of staying with Washington and sharing the house. But she said, she said to, the, to um, the officer who's in charge of kind of finding housing, he said, no, my, the house is not big enough for both General and me. me. Right? So it's not big enough for the both of us. So she left. Uh, so that's where Washington headquarters are. And then most of the men are down in uh, New Windsor, in what is another uh, New York State historic site, the New Windsor Cantonment. And most of the men uh, uh, are living there in these uh, huts that they built. This is another picture. So that the Washington house uh, where Washington lived, that's the original that's still there today. This is a replica you're looking at here. So these are temporary houses. They were torn down a long time ago. But they were rebuilt by New York State, and I believe the 1960s. So you can see what they would have been like. Um, so that is a hot. That looks nice. I mean, I would, you know, I would live there for a, a winter vacation, a spring break, break vacation. Um, but you're probably living there with 10 or 11 other guys. Uh, 10 or 11 other guys whose hygiene kind of stinks, uh, to, to use the, the pun there. Um, which you know maybe you don't notice because your hygiene stinks too, but. Um, that's what it would like to live, uh, share a very small space with uh, a dozen other men. Um, so that's where the men are, are located. And you can imagine these men in, sitting in their huts when the, a copy of the letter arrives and reading this aloud to each other, then arguing over it is the kind of scene that would have played out um, on that, that, that it was a Monday morning when the, uh, when the letter circulated through camp. Uh, now when Washington gets this letter, the only, um, back at his headquarters, I would not have been the man to want to deliver that to Washington uh, because Washington, of course, had a terrible, terrible temper and he mostly kept it under control. But, you know, you know, people who are, who are wound really tight uh, when the emotions burst out, they really burst out. So the, the only description that I have of Washington's reaction uh, simply said that he was amazingly agitated. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can kind of use you can use your your imagination for what that what that really entailed. Um, yeah, again, I would not have wanted to be the man to deliver that, that, yeah. that, that letter. Um, uh, poor guy has to, has to stand there while Washington yells and probably rages around. Uh, so that's, that's where Washington is when he gets the news. When, so, I mean, what, what, how does he, I mean, he, he is the, the head of the army. There is discussion of, to, 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 to borrow a line from the TV show Arrested Development, you know, some light treason. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, what does he do about it? So once Washington calms down, um, his public response is, is, is really shrewd. Uh, he gives the impression that everything is under control, that this is not a major challenge. Um, he does not denounce this publicly as treason or mutiny or anything like that. Uh, he, he waits until the, the next morning's general orders uh, to make an announcement saying that the officers will not meet um, as they had called for. The, the original letter from Armstrong had asked them to meet um, the next day. So this would be Tuesday of that, of that week. Um, Washington says, no, there's no meeting you know, on Tuesday, but you can meet on the following Saturday. So it gives the men some time to cool off, which is exactly what he wanted. And he gave them their 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 uh, their agenda. He said that they would uh, deliberate maturely and decide what be what measures would be uh, best employed to uh, get get the pensions and the, the payment that they wanted. 
So Washington gives us this, the impression that everything's under control, that this is not really out of order, uh, you know, kind of settle yourselves down and think about things maturely. You think about what Washington could have done. So he could have sent, you know, called for his military police and sent them out and thought, said, you know, find whoever wrote this and bring them to me. Okay? But he doesn't do that because, well, then everybody in, everybody in the country, in the world will find out that the these officers were on the verge of mutiny in the army. And what kind of army is this? And everyone in Europe would know that, you know, liberty was falling apart, that people can't really govern themselves, that the revolution was for nothing. Okay, so he doesn't want that kind of that kind of message to get out. So instead he tells them basically, calm down, you can have your meeting, but be mature about it. Well, and so, I mean, there, there uh, so if I, my timeline is correct, that meeting is, is that's the that's the fifteenth of March, right? Correct. The the men they eventually do assemble, which is of course a, famous because because Washington will give a, a his, his his speech there. So the the building is called the Temple of Virtue, and there's another replica of it at the New Windsor Cantonment site. Um, I have a picture there of the outside. Uh, Washington. And so some of the younger officers called it the Temple of Virtue. I think that's a Masonic. Uh, a Masonic reference. Yeah. Uh, Washington had less imagination. He simply called it the new building uh, because it was the newest building in the cantonment. Uh, yeah, he needed some better some better branding there. Uh, if you take a look inside, you can see it's just it's just a kind of multi-purpose space where they would have meetings, they'd have chapel, they could have parties. There's office space and storage space. Okay. Um, there's a dais at the end for the the, the speaker to, to to speak from. If you look very close, you can see a fire extinguisher by that green door, which I'm, I'm, I'm sad to tell you was not uh, authentic to the period. Um, you know, like, I was there, like, oh, forget these safety features. I want 18th century authenticity with a risk, with a risk of being burned to death as part of the fun. Um, now, on that day, so they're having this meeting, and Washington shows up unannounced. Uh, or at least he, well, he announces himself when he's at the door. Uh, but it's unexpected. And he, he walks in the door and he asks permission of the, the men to speak. And, you know, it's like, oh, can I crash your meeting kind of thing? <laughs> um, and, of course, and of course, they say yes. But it's, it's important because it shows them the respect. Yeah. This is their meeting. And I, I, you know, I respect you by asking you for permission to speak. Right. Um, so that's a nice small gesture. And he, he gives a speech that he's prepared and he writes it out by hand. And the speech denounces the sentiments in Armstrong's letter. Uh, he, he condemns it. He asks the men to turn away from any of that kind of sentiment, to not sully their honor, that they've worked so hard to, to earn the respect of you know every army in the world, the way they've conducted themselves. And he's really warning them. If you go forward with any kind of rash measures, your honor will be completely lost. At the end of the speech, this is the very famous moment that people tend to remember about this, about this story. Washington decides to read a letter um, from a uh, delegate to Congress from Virginia. That's a letter that's updating Washington on what's going on. And I think why Washington wants to read this letter is that it provides evidence that Congress is working on the Irish problems, but it's just moving slowly. Yeah. That's what the letter says. It's from a man named Joseph Jones. Jones is saying, we're working on it, but you know how Congress works. We just plod along very slowly. Okay. Washington starts to read this letter and it seems like he can't make out the handwriting. Because it's not his, and it's smaller than the, uh, the the address that he read, so he he needs his glasses. So Washington reaches into his uh, to his coat, and he uh, he pulls out his glasses. Now these are glasses that he had just started wearing like the previous month, so hardly any of these officers have ever seen him wearing these glasses. So this is a surprise, and he pulls those glasses out, and I, I think just imagining the moment and what the glasses really look like. I think there would have been an awkward pause in that moment where he's kind of putting these glasses on. Uh, 18th century glasses are not like today, where you can, you can pop them on and off and it's not, you know, it's not a big problem. But 18th century glasses, you kind of had to kind of thin them around your head and then you had to find the right, you know, focus because they're, they're, you know, not ground in a lab like today. They're, they're kind of a guy does it. So there would have been this awkward pause. You can see there how that, that, that back part would have you know, wrapped it around, around your head to get it to fit right. Um, so you would have had to get that there. And so there's an awkward pause. And one of the things a gentleman just comes naturally to a gentleman is to smooth over life's awkward pauses. So, so Washington has this moment where he says, 
uh, some version of the following. He says, excuse me, gentlemen, you see I've not only grown gray, but also blind in your service. And it seems like that kind of very quick remark has a, uh, a, a, a very strong effect on the men. Uh, it really dashes any enthusiasm they might have had to kind of send a strong message to Congress. They see Washington vulnerable, that he suffered alongside of them, and they decide, you know, we're going to trust Washington. We'll ask him to intervene on our behalf. I like these these glasses here. Uh, one of the things that really convinced me that, yeah, there's a, a moment here where it took them, it might have taken them a few seconds to put these on. They really remind me of uh, my, my, my four-year-old daughter had glasses. And they always look, uh, to me, they always, they look a lot like Washington's glasses. Uh, and you see the little the little strap on the back. You have to get around them, right? Because a little too little kid, you take them off if you can. Um, it, it's hard, right? And I'm assuming you know Washington didn't you know try to, to run away and have someone chase him to put his glasses on uh, the, way, the way my little sweetheart does. Um, but yeah, that's that kind of really cemented to me that it would have been difficult to put those put put those on. At least not difficult. It would have taken a few seconds to get those on. Um, You'll be amazed at telling my four-year-old, you know, come here and put on your George Washington glasses. You don't, don't you want to look like George? That, that's, that's not very persuasive. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, no, I, well, I can confirm because we, um, I was I was the uh, on-screen advisor for when we, we did our, um, or if, if anyone's from, or I know you're aware of it, but our B. Washington uh, uh, simulations, uh, mm -hmm. we have we have 15 different, Four different scenarios. Each of them are like 15 minutes. Uh, you can go to be wash play be and, and see it. But uh, one of them is the Newburgh conspiracy, and so we filmed, you know, the address and and the actor, yeah, screwed up a number of times trying to get. Oh, for fun, yeah. We can confirm, uh, mm -hmm. and and you know, we've gotten in the prop that was based off of the real one. So can confirm they uh, they do take someone uh, a while. Right. Um, that's going to be put though, right? Because that's, you know, it's, it's, he's only been wearing these a few weeks, right? He's, he's inexperienced, yeah. right? Well, and I think it's also probably for for someone that had been trying to sort of project martial prowess for eight years, uh, you know, and someone that, you know, starts the war with people commenting about his, you know, bright red hair mm -hmm. and and his strong physique and everything else that, I mean, you you. You know, we see what the presidency does to eight years of people serving in it now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's with all the benefits of 21st century medicine. Imagine what, uh, you know, the physical degeneration would have looked like over those eight years. Um, mm -hmm. And would have been, you know, I think I think you're right. A sort of reflective moment for some of those officers that have been with them the whole time. Um, well, I think we have some questions from the audience uh, that we're going to to take now because they are eager to speak with you. Uh, and so the first one is about how many Continental uh, Forces were stationed at Newburgh? You know, uh, enlisted about, officers. Right, so the Army, there's about 10,000, 10,000 men um, in the, the Hudson Highlands region. Uh, so that's sort of Newburgh, New Windsor, and West Point. Um, I think maybe a couple other smaller detachments, other places. So, so about 10,000. And about how many officers, roughly? I mean, I think. Oh, was, I don't know. I never. Yeah, I don't know that one offhand. I, I, yeah, I mean, if if they were, if they were by regulation, which I doubt they mm -hmm. were, it probably would have been around like five percent of the total. But that's so about five. I have a book so back that, there that would I'm, tell me, but I don't want to go pull it out right now. Right. So, uh, um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, I can picture the book. There's a, a a large blue book that I use for those numbers, which I can picture right now. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably maybe a hundred or so guys um, at the meeting. Um, there's no no definitive um, there's no definitive uh, you know you know uh, they, they didn't take uh, attendance at the meeting. But yeah. the the, the uh, new the new building the uh, Temple of Virtue could probably hold about a hundred or so people. Well, what, I'm going to ask you real quick because it, it just popped in my head because you mentioned that you know because not every officer that was in the area attends. And there's sort of a few noticeable absences. Uh, like one of the things I've always found amazing, and I was curious if you you uh, had seen more with it. Where the heck is Henry Knox the whole time? Like he I, he he's conveniently absent when all of that goes down. That he'd been in the area, and like all of a sudden he's like, I got to go inspect some cannons somewhere. I, mean, I think Knox is at Knox is at the meeting. Oh, is he? Um, okay. Yes. So Knox is at the meeting. But he was so he was a, so he's the commander at West Point. 
uh, during this period. And um, he did, so, so he's commander at West, West Point. I think it's the, the, the bad, bad weather prevents him from getting up to Newburgh. There's a letter, there's a letter he sends to Washington, I believe, where he references the badness of the ice in the river or so, something like that. Um, so I, I take it as evidence that probably Washington wanted to consult with him. Um, but I don't have evidence that he ever did. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a letter from, I think, Thursday, the Thursday of the week. So he could have come up on Friday if the, uh, the weather were better. Uh, but, but I don't know. I think so by Saturday of that week, the weather was good enough to come up. There's a letter either from him or from uh, one of his aides saying that the, I think this is a letter where the what his aide says basically we, we rode back we rode back to West Point in complete silence. We were so stunned and, and overwhelmed by, by by the occasion. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, can you describe the advice Washington's various advisors gave him regarding how he should deal with the Newburgh situation? Right, so I don't have any, we don't have any direct advice, we don't have any direct evidence of this, because they would have been meeting face-to-face. Um, and just have a little few bits and pieces about what might have happened. Um, I think Washington probably did seek out um, advice of some of his senior trusted officials. That was certainly Washington's MO. Um, he liked to have kind of these uh, councils of war. And then, and then later, uh, there's a wonderful new book about the cabinet that talks yeah. about how, how Washington's cabinet meetings uh, really played off of that, that tendency to want to kind of, uh, kind of share decision-making and also the blame sharing if something went wrong. Uh, so I think Washington probably did seek out the, uh, the advice of others around him, um, but it's not clear what exactly they they decided or what they came up with. Again, they're they're just they're meeting face to face, so they, that would not necessarily have been recorded. Some officers do remember. Um, some of this comes from later on. They do remember sort of what guy writes about Washington, you know, appearing in in New Windsor to consult with officers, um, and I I don't I think he probably misremembered that. That it was in New New um, that it was in New Windsor, probably would have been something in Newburgh instead. Of the officers who are living there, but some officers are living in Newburgh itself, not with the main body of the army in New Windsor. So yes, yeah, so there's probably some consult consultation there, but it's not clear what exactly the input was, or yeah. you know what what exactly would that might change his mind or anything. Any of the details like that, we don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think that that late war period so interesting because, like you said, Washington was was you know, sort of famous for for seeking lots of advice. But by the late war, most of his sort of top go to guys are are busy doing other functions elsewhere. You have grains down south, mm-hmm. Knox at, at at West Point. Um, so I, I'm trying to think of even off the top of my head who his normal go to would have been that were even in the area to give him advice. I mean Hamilton's. Hamilton's down in Congress saying, "Right, heck yeah, let's let's scare Congress a little bit." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm blanking on the name of the person. So there's somebody who writes kind of a one of the generals uh, from Massachusetts. He writes a kind of a kind of a counter argument to Armstrong's letter, and I have the draft of it, uh, but it apparently did not circulate because you know I, I guess somebody must have told him probably don't do this, okay. Because if you start, you know, making this an argument, then that proves that Armstrong is worth arguing with, right? You yeah. the, the kind of dignity of a response rather than, you know, just kind of icily ignoring him. So that, that kind of tells me that there probably was some discussion about how to respond to this. Uh, but exactly what they said is not that clear. Yeah. You know, Timothy Pickering was there in, uh, in Newburgh. Uh, he's the kind of person who would have, you know, he writes these letters to his wife, especially. Um, if he had talked to Washington about this kind of thing or heard that Washington was talking, he probably would have said something about it to his wife, but he doesn't. Not that I can remember. Well, uh, speaking of Timothy Pickering, uh, did he actually vocally challenge the assembly for the hypocrisy of their support of Congress after hearing from Washington versus their actions of a few days prior? Uh, no. Well, by, by his own account, he says that he, that he stayed quiet. He refused to... to, to to uh, to voice his approval of the so so what happens is that after so Washington gives a speech and then he leaves and then the the officers they kind of debate what they're going to say 
and they uh, there's a committee that writes a number of resolutions, and one of those resolutions is to condemn the letter as infamous. And I believe that's the one where Washington, where where, where Pickering says, you know, I think this is to his wife or one of his friends, says so basically this is ridiculous. These guys were in favor of it two minutes ago, and now they're saying it's infamous. You know, I'm I'm not going along with this. So he just stays silent. Um, so if you believe uh, Pickering's account, I think he doesn't voice his opposition, or you know, he doesn't say anything. He he signals his opposition by not uh, voting to approve all of these resolutions condemning the letter. Um, now, I don't, I don't think Pickering was not in favor of the letter. I mean, he, he's, he writes how he thinks it's rash and, and it's, it's too far and all that kind of stuff. But he just didn't like the way that all of a sudden everybody's picking on this letter when, you know, a few minutes earlier, they're like, oh, this is something we should talk about. No, it's infamous. So I have nothing to do with this. He, he thought that he didn't like the hypocrisy of, of changing your mind like that. But no, he didn't say, oh, let's give the letter a second chance or anything like that. They, they just, the whole room suddenly has no recollection of the events in question. Exactly right. Uh, do you think the Pennsylvania mutiny participants were emboldened by the officers' actions in the Newburgh conspiracy? Would Washington have sent troops against his officers? So I think that the, the Pennsylvania mutiny, I think that's, that's, I think it's separate. Um, I mean, of course, it's a, diff, it's a distinct event. It's close in time. It's uh, June of 1783 versus March. Um, but I don't, I don't, I mean, it wasn't the, 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 um, the Newburgh, whatever happened to Newburgh was not successful in, in, in the sense of using the, the army to push forward a threat against Congress. I mean, it was only successful in the sense of, of getting Washington to write something on their behalf. Um, so I don't know how much of an inspiration it would have been and certainly, I don't know of any evidence where anybody links the two together. Uh, although Armstrong, interestingly, Armstrong, he retires from the Army, resigns, and he takes a position, I believe he's a clerk or, or something, in Philadelphia. So he's on scene um, during that mutiny as well. And, you know, he's saying, you know, if, if, if these guys are real men and all that kind of stuff, then they can do real good. He's just he's saying a bunch of, of uh, you know, really uh, kind of strong remarks like that. Um to me, it's hard to it's always hard to know where, where Armstrong, you know, what, what, what is just like, you know, talk and venting and just, just kind of mean and what is serious. That's hard to, to, to piece apart. But Washington sent troops against his own officers. I think, I mean, only, I mean, so he does send troops against the, the Philadelphia mutineers, uh, but those are enlisted men and mutinies happen all the time. So that wasn't quite the same. Against his own officers, I think, I mean, only as the very last resort, because if he, Washington knows, if he does that, then he's basically lost anyway, that the damage to the army's reputation will be incalculable. And the damage to the nation, the new nation's reputation will be equally, you know, it'll just be terrible. The, the nation's character will be lost for good if he does this. So, you know, he has to do everything possible to head it off ahead of time. Because if it comes to the point where he needs to use force, then he's already lost. And and maybe it's it, I guess I guess it's somewhat better not to have the, the the officers conquer the capital or something like that. I guess, but it's not much better than um, you know having to put down a, a, an officer of mutiny by force. That that's bad enough. Well, and I, I think that brings up you know one of the one of the conundrums, if you will, of of the Newburgh conspiracy, because we spent a whole lot of time talking about how the officers are all mad. And we haven't really talked a whole lot about what the enlisted thought about any of this. And, you know, would would the enlisted have actually risked their lives to go arrest the officers because the officers are worried about their retirement pensions? I just, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a point. Um... Uh, uh, Charles Royster uh, makes this point, you know, in his book, and I think it's the early 80s, right? I think he's right about this, is that, you know, these enlisted men are not going to go out of their way so that the officers can have a pension. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to risk my life and get myself, you know, hanged for mutiny because, you know, you, you want to wear a fancy uniform, all right? I got my own problems, okay? And, and that's not, and your problems are not my problems. So I really don't see the enlisted men going very far. And, you know, if they were sent, you know, ordered to put down 
uh, the officers mutiny led by other officers. Okay, then you got to make a choice. Are you going to follow orders uh, or are you going to you know, disobey orders? So maybe they just follow orders in that circumstance. But, you know, the, the, this is really an officer's, an officer's problem. Yeah. Well, and like you said, if it gets to that point, the whole thing's already gotten right. out it's, of control and the British are just laughing, drinking mm -hmm. their tea down in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, craziness. Uh, what did Washington convey to the Continental Congress regarding uh, what had happened in Newburgh? Yeah, so, so, so Washington, this is really interesting. So a couple of the, on the Wednesday of that week, um, I guess that's the 12th, March 12th. I remember the day of the week better than the number, uh, uh, strangely. Uh, so the day, so he, Washington writes a couple of letters, one of them to the president of the Continental Congress, kind of officially informing them of what's going on. Um, and, you know, he, he tells them that this, this is, this, this could go badly. Um, but, he, but he basically gives the impression that he has it under control, that, that he believes that with some time to cool off, the, the, the men, the, the passions will, will subside, right? Well, I mean, what, what else could he say? Like, you know, the whole thing's done, like, what, right? So he basically has to say, I, you know, gives the impression I have this under control. And the reaction from Congress is concern, but also they, they have the trust that Washington does have this under control, that he'll deal with this. Um, after the events of, of uh, March 15th, Washington is a really interesting thing. I think it's very clever. He portrays the, the whole thing, the whole thing as not something shameful, but something glorious. Okay, this evidence that our army can come right to the face to face with temptation and maintain their honor. Okay, so unlike that, he doesn't say the, the new model army or something, but of course that's in everybody's mind. So unlike that new model army or unlike these other armies, our guys are so virtuous that even all these privations, even the strong statement asking them to, to you know, to, to threaten Congress, none of that can move them. That's how great of patriots they are. And therefore, that's how deserving they are of Congress's attention and the money. They, they can handle it. You don't have to worry about them, you know, being a threat to liberty or anything. They can come right up to the edge and walk away from it because their virtue is so strong. So very clever. Just kind of, I don't know. Is it is it jujitsu? Is the is the martial art where you yeah, take yeah. the the, the opponent's you know energy and toss them the other way or something like that? Uh, very very shrewd politically. Washington is such a good politician. We don't appreciate that. That he takes what should be a crisis and embarrassing and turns it into this wonderful moment that is proof of how strong the army really is. Yeah, I thought I, I, I'm with you there. I think it's fascinating how he, he manages to sort of blow up all the op eds saying mm -hmm. armies cannot be trusted. And then he's like, well, mine just what can, exactly. it can be. So pay the men. Uh, do you think Washington knew exactly what he was doing when he pulled out his glasses before he gave his speech? So I guess it depends on what, what, what do you mean by know what he was doing? Did he know? that it would have an effect on his men. Was this kind of a theatrical gesture? Did, did he plan the whole thing from the beginning? These are questions um, I puzzled over for a long time. And the conclusion I came to, the, the kind of decision I finally made, uh, was that the whole, the whole moment there was part planned and part spontaneous. I think Washington came ready to read this letter from Joseph Jones. Um, but I'm not sure that he decided ahead of time to read this letter. Um, I think he kind of, he might have, he possibly held it back just in case, you know, the original appeal didn't go uh, over 100%. So uh, I should say, Washington brings several letters, several documents that he eventually leaves with the men after he leaves the building for them to inspect. So he has several documents. Jones's document is one of them. So it's possible his plan was initially to just kind of leave this Jones letter with with the, the men there to, to look at on their own time. Okay? So, but I think he's also open to the idea that he's going to read it. I mean, he brings his glasses with him, right? I mean, he, he's, ready, he's ready to read something. Um, he's, a read, he's a reading glasses, not, not for distance. Okay? So he's ready to read something. So there's that part of the plan. Um, another thing, I looked very closely at the, at the actual manuscripts, and there are some very interesting marks in portions of the uh, of the documents of Washington's speech, and then some later some recordings or some copies that were made by by people who attended the speech, right? Because Washington leaves this for them to copy out, and then you know circulate to whoever doesn't come to the meeting. And 
some of these marks on these copies, they correspond to material that it probably would not have been a good idea for Jones to read, or Jones, uh, for Washington to, to read from that Jones letter. So copies of the Jones letter that are there in the original, but not in the copies. And this is some extraneous stuff. Uh, Jones is writing about a uh, situation in Vermont or something like that. Okay. And there's some other kind of passages that are cut out kind of in the middle. I think would have been, so that kind of tells me that maybe Washington did not read those, that the men just copied out what he actually read. And if they're copying it on that same day, they would have remembered you know, what he just read. Um, so that's kind of suggestive, you know, not, 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 you know, not solid, definite proof, but suggestive, right? That, you know, you couldn't just edit out this, some of these lines on the fly. You would have had to do that ahead of time by kind of preparing. But some of these things are like in the middle of a sentence, right? You can't just do that while you're reading. Um, I think then Washington, what he said about the um, growing gray and blind, I think that's spontaneous. And once he decides to put on his glasses, like I said, I think there's this awkward moment and it just comes second nature, second hand to a, uh, to a gentleman to just smooth over any awkwardness in social life by saying something. And you know, Washington just says this thing and it, I think unexpectedly have that effect on the men. So I think that whole scene there, um, I think it's part planned and part spontaneous. And I don't think Washington could have foreseen the, the kind of galvanizing effect it would have on, on the men there. Was it normal during this time for an army to make payment by promise uh, instead of actually paying soldiers? So if the, the question means to compare to, to other um, 18th century armies, I don't know what the British practice was or how reliable their, their, their payment was. Honestly, I just don't know what other, army, other armies did. Uh, certainly it was normal for the, for the Americans during the American Revolution. And that's the way all these armies did it. The, the, the states sometimes paid their men. Uh, but again, state currencies had depreciated. Uh, so, so I don't compare the if it's a comparative question. I don't know, uh, but certainly this was the American experience in all different theaters of the war throughout the American Revolution. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't unheard of in European armies, but in most European armies, there absolutely would have been the expectation of some sort of discontent from the soldiers fairly soon after not being paid because it was much more of a contractual relationship. Mm -hmm. What compelled you to write about this specific moment in history? Did you come across anything that surprised you? Did you end up looking at Washington in a new light? Yeah, so this is, um, that's a great question. So the origin story of the book, um, it was kind of long and involved. I'll give you the, the, the shorter version. Uh, so my, my first book, my real research specialty when I was uh, training in grad school was sort of early 19th century. Uh, early 19th century maritime history. That's what my, my first book was about, uh, 1810s, 1820s, and uh, privateering and piracy and all that kind of stuff. So that, that was my focus earlier in my career. But as I uh, kind of my career went forward, and, you know, I have family and all that kind of thing, I realized that I need something that I can do without a lot of travel. Um, you know, just kind of multi-archival work like I did when I was single in grad school, that, that's not going to work anymore. So doing something on the American Revolution really attracted me because we have all these wonderful um, resources. All the all the papers of the founders are now available online. It's wonderful. A lot of these guys wrote uh, memoirs about their experiences, and those are available on Google Books and and other um, other repositories. Uh, a lot of these guys have their stuff microfilmed. Okay, so just the availability of the the sources really um, really attracted me to this period. And writing about the Newburgh conspiracy, you know, I read some of the scholarship on this, and really the scholarship kind of stopped in the 1970s. There was an exchange of, of um, exchange of views between a number of scholars, and it hadn't really developed since then. And I thought, you know, I, I could take a look into this and see if there's anything more there. And, you know, at the very least, I can write something new in a new and compelling way. So that's what kind of got me started, a kind of practical need then kind of identifying a kind of intellectual uh, intellectual gap there in the literature, something that hadn't been done in a long time. Um, but it surprised me. I think it's surprising, you know, someone who did not, was not trained in this you know, American Revolution military history, um, just the, the depth of suspicion between civilians and the army was, was surprising to me. 
not, people studying this very closely would not be surprised. But it, it's surprising to see how suspicious ordinary people were of the military. Um, in 21st century America, you know, Americans love veterans, right? And then we celebrate them all the time and thank them for their service and all that kind of thing. And that was just not the way things were done in the, uh, the late 18th century. I mean, armies were a threat to liberty. The professional armies, I should say, were a threat to liberty. So that was, that was surprising to me. And Washington, if you in Washington, one thing that really, I don't, this is more of an impression than anything else, it has to do with Washington's height. I think this is interesting. So Washington is, has this reputation for being very tall, right? He's a very tall man. Um, and I guess there's some discussion over exactly how tall he was, about 6'2". Sometimes it says 6'4". Right, he tells his tailor, "I'm six foot," but his clothes are always always complaining about how his clothes don't fit. So maybe he can measure himself correctly. Um, one of the things I saw that was there are men. So I thought, well, Washington must be this giant, stands a, you know head above everybody else. But I kept seeing that there are other men who are just as tall or even taller. Right, that there's you know a Robert Morris, who's uh, the superintendent of finance. He's six foot tall. Uh, Gouverneur Morris is also tall. Uh, there's supposedly there's a, a French uh, a French naval captain. Uh, I, I bet the story is uh, apocryphal, but I'll tell it anyway. Supposedly he greets uh, Washington by calling him my, my little general. <laughs> the, the naval officer is like six four, six five, or something. But yet everybody thinks Washington is very tall. I think that gives you. Right, so he is above average height, right? So he's probably he's 99th percentile, right? Um, but he's not like seven foot. He's not Shaquille O'Neal. Um, he's not. You know that level NBA center today, right? At, at UCF where I teach, we used to, there's a, a player several a couple years ago who was seven six, right? You see that I never saw him in person. But you see that for you remember how tall that, that guy is. So where does that idea of Washington's height come from? Part of it I think is just kind of the impression that he left with other people, his outstanding military bearing, but also kind of the charisma that these people to kind of think that he's bigger physically bigger than he really is because you know he's kind of have that. An emotional part of it, uh, also. So I think just kind of thinking through that, and I realized a little bit. I think of what made Washington special: the, the the impression he made on others that made him like feel larger than maybe he really was. Um, but that, that's just it's just not again. I don't have that. That's not strong evidence. That's not you know direct evidence that people uh, of what happened. But I think it gives you some idea of of really and the effect Washington had on others. No, I mean, he, he might have just been, you know, scrappy little NBA point guard field general. Right, well, yeah. well, well th those guys are also like 6'3", right? I mean, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, well, he is David Head. The book is A Crisis of Peace. David, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was delightful. Uh, thank all of you, the viewers, for joining us tonight. And uh, thank you for writing the book, David, and, and we'll uh, see you all soon. Hey, well, thanks again for having me. It's been, it's been a real pleasure.